Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Pit Stop Podcast. It's lights out and away we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's go. Good idea. Mate, you, you smashed it. You smashed it. If you Checks didn't, in the post. If you didn't know already, we've got David Croft on the Pit Stop Podcast, Let's ladies and gents. Go. Well, welcome to Shay Crofty. Thank you so much. We're in your humble abode. Yeah, I've got a present for you as well. You do? I have got a present for you because you can't come around here without a present. Um, but I was told you guys wanted oh to be part of the Sky Sports word. community. So there you are. Oh, my <laughs> word. Mate. <laughs> Look, so that is unreal. Can we swap these out? I want to just what use one of those. Stuff. Did you know about this? <laughs> Alex knew. I just want to sit here like this now. Yeah. <laughs> a- a- Alex, our, our wonderful press and PR director, said uh, the boys are after a Christmas present. And, you know, as Christmas is coming. You sneaky man. We did not know this was happening. <laughs> it's going straight in the background. <laughs> Thank Love you so it. much. Mate, Welcome. how are you? you I'm okay? good, actually. Uh, I got back from Abu Dhabi yesterday. Yeah. And um, I, I, I haven't got to write any notes out for a few weeks. I haven't got to, uh, I haven't got to pack a suitcase. Yeah. And I don't have to get on an aeroplane for a while, which I will miss in about a week's time. Yeah. But this has been my life since, uh, since March. Yeah. Kind of pack, unpack, get to a place, unpack, all of that. It's, uh, it's quite a relentless schedule. But it's it's, uh, it's nice to be at home for a bit. Oh, I should turn my phone off really. We've I? done four races this year and like we, we feel blasted after it so how, i mean you do every single race you must be knackered like year round yeah you, you, you get used to it though to be mm. fair and um and i enjoy i i enjoy knowing at the start of the year what my schedule is and i can plan my other life around it as it yeah. were i can plan my social time uh, around that but i think as a commentator you, you need to have that that instant recall so if something happens during the course of a race the fact that i've been talking about something similar maybe two races ago, it's there. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's in the brain. Um, and yes, if I missed a race, I would be sat watching Sky's coverage of it. But you don't necessarily have that instant recall that you would have from from having worked on it. So uh, continuity, I think, is always important. Unbelievable amount of questions I want to get into uh, <laughs> about you being a commentator. Okay. But I feel like I want to take it straight away, right back to the beginning. Because one question I have, which I want to know, is when... At what point in your life did you discover you have a good voice? Was there like a moment where you're like eight years old and you're like looking in the mirror and you say something and you're like, that's a good voice? Or did um, someone say? No, I, I don't know really. Um, I, I think voice is important. Yeah. I think you need to, to, to cut over the sound of Formula One, of the cars, and the squealing of the tyres, the, the crowd, etc. It, it's taken me quite a while to get used to my voice, to be honest, because obviously you, you have headphones on and you listen very differently with, with the headphones yeah, yeah. on. And I found it a bit weird, especially in the early days as well, when my voice, when I was working for Five Live, I'd be driving in the car and then suddenly there'd be a trailer for the next Grand Prix and my voice would come out come over out, the radio. Yeah. And it's like, oh my Lord, that, that sounds a little bit weird. That's, <laughs> that's not me at all. That's someone else. Um, and then, you know, I'll be sat on the very sofa that you're sat on at the moment and there'll be a trailer for, for, for the next Grand Prix on Sky. And I'm like, oh, is that what I sound like? <laughs> Um, but other, it's for other people to tell me if I've got a good voice or not. Yeah. I, th- I think I, I project well. Um, I get accused of shouting sometimes. I, I'm not a shouter. Everything is projected. Uh, and in the excitement, you know, it gets a bit loud. <laughs> I think we, we had a, a health and safety officer came uh, to one of the races this year and he measured how loud it got in the commentary box. And I think I'm 10 decibels quieter than a Formula One car, oh, wow. <laughs> which is actually quite loud, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure how that would compare to you know, you know, the V8s and the, the, the V10 era, but it's still fairly loud. But it's, it's, it's certainly not shouting. But I... Um, I, I, I always wanted to be a sports commentator. That, that was that was the job when I was eight years old that I yeah. really wanted to do because I was mm. I was captivated by these guys that brought excitement and wonder into into my living room or into my radio set and my TV uh, set. And I thought I don't want to be that person. Mm. You know, gr- I grew up in Stevenage, a small town in Hertfordshire. You might have heard of it. It's it's got a few things going for it. Seven-time world champion comes from there as well. Oh, yeah. um, okay. But he walks the walk, I talk the talk. And I wasn't great at sport, but I love sport. And I love I love taking part. But I I love pretending to be a commentator as a kid as yeah. well. We That's do where it. the bug started. I used started. to do that when I was young. I'd Did run around the garden. I'd run around the garden playing football. And it'd be like, it's <laughs> Thierry Henry. Yeah. It'd be me running, yeah. taking off my shirt, running around. Yeah. I'd give myself red cards. I'd substitute myself. But even nice. now at 27 years old, and we watch the F1, or we play the F1 game at I'm home. 26. 26, no, yeah. nearly got, 27. Got 
and uh, he'll be, we'll be like screaming at the TV, like trying to do what you do. But we are literally shouting as loud as we can shout. Um, and I love it. When, when I do stuff on stage and we do some live stuff, we'll, we'll have a bit of a commentary competition, call some people up from the audience just to have a go. And invariably, people give it their best shot and about 10 seconds in, run out of things to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and then you, you find... Um, you find normally, actually, it's, it's the younger members. It's you know, it's, it's some of the kids in the audience are much better at it than than their mums and dads, mm. uh, for instance. And I, I remember I, I went to a school uh, a few years ago and did an assembly at a, at a junior school, and we did a, a creative language kind of assembly, and got all the kids to come up and be commentators, and they were fantastic. Some of the things the kids were saying, I'm like, just describe, say what you see, and put it into exciting words. And the kids were brilliant at it. And, yeah. and I just think that we all we all love commentary. We all love sport. We all want to get excited. And if you two are shouting at the TV, that, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's yeah. what I want. That's that's the sort of passion we need to be watching our sport with, I think. Well, like you said, it, it is everything. Like, we started Pit Stop at the start of this year. And we were gripped, obviously, by Drive to Survive to start with. But, like, just having your voice like at the race it makes it so much more exciting and it is a big reason why we started the pod was because of what you do well thank so, you for that and i said that to you, you in a club vegas. in vegas yes, yeah i was I, pissed yeah. out of my head <laughs> <laughs> I, Jake, apparently i was talking yeah, to you for you an were hour talking about so long and you don't say remember you don't remember anything don't you remember said a word. You were to, to, I, I was on the verge of calling security uh, but <laughs> I, I realized i'd already given you my phone number so that wasn't gonna wash <laughs> Uh, to be honest, I haven't but, been that bad, have I? But Vegas, as we established that night, Vegas is where it all started for me, Formula well, One wise. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's dive into it because Vegas is, now has a special place in my heart because it's where we did the F1 launch, met yep. you, obviously, with gnomes and that, but it's also very special for you as well. well absolutely. I, I was working for the BBC uh, in 2005, and I've been with the Beeb for, for a, a few years. And I wanted to specialise. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd done little bits, but I wanted to really get stuck into a sport not knowing really how to go about that or how to get stuck into a sport. I was doing a bit of football commentary. I was doing the darts uh, for TV uh, at uh, the lakeside. But um, I was in Vegas with a guy who happened to be the producer for Formula One for, for Five Live. And one night, and we were a little bit tipsy at the time, um, he said, well, you need to be a Formula One commentator. I'm like, yeah, shut up. Formula One commentator, it never happened. Mm. Went, well, no, seriously, we, we need a new commentator. Why don't you come and audition? Give it a go and and see how you get on. I said, really? He said, well, yeah, because it's going to go to an independent production company. We're going to change things around a bit. I'm attached to one bid. Come and give it a go. So uh, about three weeks later, I sat in a studio and had to commentate on a on the first lap. First lap at Monza, I think, was, a, was the track we chose. And I made it up. It was like going back to being an eight-year-old again. I had to make the commentary up wow. just, just to fit this audition tape. Did you so, know the drivers and know the cars at the yeah, time? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I was a fan. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't the world's <laughs> biggest F1 fan. Yeah. But I did watch it, and I, and I certainly liked it. And so I made up this commentary and then thought nothing of it for a few weeks. And then on the, uh, the 23rd of December, 2005, I get called into the, uh, the manager's office at Five Live, and I was told, yes, congratulations, um, you've got the job. I'm like, really? Wow. Seriously? Like, yeah, you're our new Formula One commentator. Uh, wow. wh when do you want to leave? I said, what do you mean, when do you, when do you want me to leave? I've got a job, you know, yeah. commentator. He went, well, no, it's an independent production company. They're going to pay you now, so you're going to have to go freelance. So I had to give up, you know, what was a full-time job with the BBC to go freelance on a one-year contract mm. and try my hand at something completely new with no guarantees at the end of the season if it didn't work out. Mm. Yeah. But compared to how I came into the BBC, that was actually quite a, a luxury offer because I was um, I was working kind of uh, full-time as a theatre publicity officer uh, back in 1995. I was doing bits on the side for Three Counties Radio I was doing their, their breakfast sports bulletins. I was working as a, I was working as a football commentator on a Saturday for West Country TV, and um, I got asked, "Did you want to do the the breakfast bulletins all the time?" And I'm like, "Guys, I'm I'm really exhausted here. I'm yeah. not getting much time off. Mm. If you want to give me that full time, give me a full time job. Yeah, uh, I think it's only fair." So I got offered a month's contract. So I gave up my then full-time job in the theatre for one month with the BBC. And it took me about three seconds to, to make that decision. Because, mm. as I say, it was what I always wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the moral of this story is back yourself, take a risk and, uh, and have a bit of fun on the way. 
Did you know getting into Formula One that how crazy your life would be? Like you guys no. travel all the time. Like you're never yeah, home. There were only 16 races back then, of course. Oh, uh, okay. And, uh, so 2006 was my first season. Um, did I realise how it would consume your life? No. Mm. Did I realise how much I needed to learn? No. Spent the, you know, I'm still learning now, yeah. uh, to be honest, and was 17 years on. But I wasn't prepared for the sheer intensity of the sport as a commentator mm. and the amount of information you have to process during the course of a race to keep on top of things. It's really interesting. Uh, Jensen Button's been with us uh, in the commentary box a few times. Yeah. And, and Jensen and I have known each other you know, since 2006. And I remember <laughs> we had a conversation after uh, his first race. And I said, do you remember that time a few years ago where you, you had a go at me for not mentioning you much during the course of a race? <laughs> he went, yeah, I do. I said, you told me that you, you know, I, had, I had to keep on top of everything and you did a load of things that weren't picked up on the TV, but I should have known about it and I should have mentioned it. And he went, yeah, yeah, I remember. I said, now, do you want to go back and revisit that conversation? Went, Crofty, honestly, mate, I don't know how you do it. I mean, seriously, there's 20 drivers out there. Yeah. How, how, do we, how do we keep across everything? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, Jensen having made that move from a driver now into the media and has been absolutely brilliant with us at Sky. He's been yeah, unreal. He's been amazing. Yeah. We've loved we, him. He's, he's, he's super and, and one of the nicest guys you could ever wish to meet. Mm. And, uh, Jensen and I have had a lot of laughs over the years. Mm. But we, um, but it, it's that realisation that it's not just about what one driver does. <laughs> you know, teams, my other half works for a team. She doesn't care about what happens elsewhere in the race. She just cares about that team. Mm. And, and that's what happens when you go and work for a team. But obviously, we try and cover absolutely everybody. So this is what I wanted to ask. So they've shown shots on TV recently of you actually in the commentary box. I don't know if they did that in previous years, but we only just joined this year. So we kind of see your setup. And I was under the impression that you yeah. probably had... 20 screens, nope. screen for each driver. You can see what's going on. <laughs> I have no idea. You so you're just following on. the broadcast. Yeah, if we had a screen for each driver, we'd get distracted. Yeah. Now, we have the ability with Sky Race Control for Karun or Paul or Anz, whoever's on it, to keep across team radio and keep across some onboards that, that aren't shown on the, on, on the world feed. And they mm -hmm. can come in and tell us what's going on for things we can't see. But Martin and I... Or Jensen or Nico or Paul, whoever's doing the co-coms with us, we we basically we we have the world feed which you guys see, and then timing screens. And the timing screens are the plus point to enable us to tell the full story. I mean, in theory, we could commentate off a timing screen if we needed to, mm -hmm. and there have been times we've had to because we've lost the pictures. Um, you know, sometimes in this brilliant modern technological world things go wrong and and you know we'll lose the pictures but we can commentate off a timing screen or the gps tracker for instance which is always really handy especially when it comes to to, to pit stops but invariably mm -hmm. you're sorry pit stop I pit know. stop yeah. I like it when you mention it yeah i'm, I'm not going to put a tracker on you guys that, that, that i'd be like being your parents and i don't really want to do that to be fair you know you, you're old enough now to make your own mistakes um <laughs> we so, made a few. Yeah. Made a few. <laughs> so um yeah so we, we we can we can commentate off that world feed but we can also add to that world feed by keeping across the timing screen the gps tracker and trying to tell the narrative of what might be coming up we try not to tell you what's going to happen we try and tell you why something is happening mm. and how the race might unfold the way that we see it at the time. Now, that could be right one lap and it could be wrong five laps later. Yeah, mm. You know, that's the beauty of, of, of live sport without a, a tightrope on this one. We're making calls in the moment and in hindsight, that might be the wrong call. Or well, most of the time, it is the right call. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we tend to pick up on things, you know, and, and, and get that right. But there's an awful lot to try and cover. So when you like you send down to Ted in the pit lane, how does that all work? How is Ted ready? For, uh, how does he know? Can he hear you the whole time in his headset? Or does he get like a cue from someone or when he throws back to you? How is that all arranged? Ted, Ted will have the commentary on and Ted will, will spot something he wants to say. He will tell the producer who's back in London uh, at Osterley because uh, we, we have remote production now. Wow. Um, although if you listen to what's going on in the producer's headphones or Ted's, it sounds like they're next door. The, the, the fibre optic cables have been yeah, amazing. absolute uh, godsend. So Ted will say, want to come in and say such and such. And the producer will say, okay, how urgent? And Ted will say, well, 30 seconds or, no, you need to come to me now. 
the producer will then tell me in my 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 ears, uh, Ted now or go to Ted, or Karoon now or go to Karoon, or Nico wants to come in from Ibiza or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll I'll get those sort of instructions, and that that's basically how it works. And right. You get used to listening to a lot of different conversations. Yeah. You know, there are times, there are times I've got the director's assistant explaining to me how uh, Sky Main Event is going to be coming to us and they're going to give me a count and it's in three minutes time and I need to take a pause and then carry on. Um, whilst Martin Brundle's having a chat with me or yeah. whilst Otmar's having a chat with me and you just get used to listening to lots of different conversations. It's uh, it's a bit weird. The, <laughs> the Sky Main Event one happened in Brazil and hopefully no one would have noticed who was watching on the F1 feed that we had to take a pause for the Sky Made event. But it wasn't exactly the easiest because as I was getting a countdown from 10, we were on board, and I forget who it was, um, going onto the main straight, and an overtake was about to happen. It might have been a Lewis overtake, mm. uh, to be honest. And you basically, I was on the F1 channel teeing up the overtake. I had to then pause for two seconds just so that the join is nice and clean, but then pick up nice and clean um, so that it sounded like a seamless commentary mm. because obviously it's going to be replayed in highlights, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, programs for years to come yeah. or, or the, uh, the the race gets replayed. So there's there's a, a lot of things to the commentary, the, the, the technicalities of it, mm. that, you, you know, you, you become adept to in time where you have to, you know, it's a clean in, it's called, you know, a clean pickup. And you... you you make it easy for the editors or you know that if something dramatic's happened, they're going to want a sound bite mm. so that it can get replayed over and yeah. over again. I know, I, I noticed, noticed that in the last we, we noticed, yeah, there's something that you say, it was that, it was for the main event and I could, we, you could tell that you had to say it. <laughs> well, you know no, I, I mean? like the way you got Here Comes Sebastian Vettel in the oh, last yeah, for one more time. Yeah, because yeah. everyone <laughs> wanted to hear that. Well, that, yeah, that was a social media thing. Someone had got in touch with me on Twitter to say, oh, come on, can you give us a Here give Comes Sebastian one last, Vettel one yeah. more time? And I'm like, yes, it would be churlish not to. Yeah. So if the opportunity arises, I'll do it. He didn't yeah. know, and I thought, I was listening, I was watching and I was like, Crofty's going to do it. And, I was, and then on the first one, you did it. And then he cut Vettel's doing another oh, overtake and you took the chance and straight in. Yeah. Do you have to know, like right at the beginning of the race, obviously you know the grid now, you know everything about the drivers, you probably store so much information, but there's no script, is there? Like in front of no. you, you haven't got like a script. No, so when they hand to us, actually, I'll tell you what. Oh, here we go, there. he's off. Oh, here we he's, go. Oh, he's left us here in his we house. Go. I am actually scared, to be honest, though, because he gave me a coffee and he's got lovely carpets. Mate. And we know what we're like. How many drinks do we spill? Well, I'm sat here in Crofty's house with my socks on. Oh, he's got a lovely bag. I'm going to be there. So this, this was my birthday present from my other half, who said, uh, uh, Laura, who said, Crofty, for heaven's sake, you walk around with a tatty computer bag, put your notes in something decent. Sort it out. Uh, so... Here's my notes. Are we right? going to have a look at Crofty's notebook? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Crofty's wow. notebook. Well, so first of all, this is my Bible. Yeah. This is the Deschano Grand Prix guide. Jesus. Weighty. It, it does look heavy. It is a weighty tome. Wow. I didn't expect that to be heavy. It, it has a lot to it. Baggage allowance. But have you read all of this? Uh, <laughs> what, what is <laughs> Over the years. What so on that, earth so is it's basically, so it's, uh, in the white pages are every single race in the Formula One World Championship up until the end of last season. So when it's I buy basically a, a Wikipedia. Yeah. Well it's more than that. It's like a wisdom. Ah. Because it's got <laughs> it's got statistical records for drivers, teams, engines, then it's got stats, you know Champions, youngest pole sitters, all that this sort of thing. It's almost like an alien sort of object. I've not like held a book people. since I was at school. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Books are good. Yeah, and, and books are very handy in commentary boxes, even though I do have a laptop up there as well, because you can find things really, really quickly. So it's got all in the, the books. And they update the speeds this every, in here. Like. They update this every year. Yeah, uh, Jacques Deschano, fine man, fine journalist of many years' experience, will update that every year. So when I get next year's, it will have 1,079 races worth of info in there. That is crazy. Do you like how serious. I know there are 1,079 races in the F1 stats. World Championship? Well, the only reason I do know that is because, and I've got it written down here, they introduced medals um, in Abu Dhabi. See, you saw Max uh, had the winner's medal? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is brand new. And in the FIA press release, it said, and they will be engraved with the number uh, race that it is. And this is 1079th F1 World Championship event. Can't wow. call them all Grand Prix because there was the Indy 500 in there. And then yeah. I wrote it down yeah. on my notes. because so I thought, well, that'd be a really good stat just to give out, wouldn't it? 1079 yeah. sounds like I've been up all night. <laughs> so you basically, you get information from everywhere. So when when they come to us, 
Um, I'll have this page first in my hand. That's the track map. Wow. And wait, do you do this before the race? Is I, it, you if, work on this like days I, I, before? Uh, a few days before. <laughs> Why is it in red and is you wear like 3D glasses when you read it? And it, it just pops out into me. No, because I think it looks neater. It does look nice. You've got no, nice handwriting. I do. I've got I, I really small handwriting. <laughs> Martin Brundle says he can't read my writing. Um, and actually without my glasses on, I can't read my writing at the moment either. But it will just tell you things like... Um, uh, lap distance at full throttle it will tell you uh, what round we're at it will tell you a few things about the grand prix the speeds uh, at each corner and the gear that they're in as well there's a stupid stat about ferrari world on this one so but that's the one uh, over the track map um that i will have in my hand just just to kind of reference a few things on there mm-hmm. and none of it is scripted because it's my job to watch the pictures and to react yeah. to them and if I was scripting it, I'd be like doing this all the time and I wouldn't see what was going on. Yeah. And I have no idea what's coming at me. Can I have a look at one of them? Yeah, of course you can just read some of the I'm, stuff that you I have absolutely no right. idea what is coming at me in oh, terms of nice the pictures. Handwriting. Thank you very much. In terms of the pictures, because. It's very small. <laughs> it's very small. I told you I need my glasses. It's got a few bucks like this. We're right up <laughs> to your face. Yeah, it's, it's you very wait, small. You wait for the next one. And then, I, so I have my grid as well. So when we do the grid countdown, there's my handwritten grid um, because. I think if you handwrite it out, you remember it more easily. Mm-hmm. So when I chuck in things like um, it's the seventh time Lando Norris has started seventh or whatever, um, that's that's where that'll come. Paul Max Verstappen, tenth time he's taken pole at the same venue for three years in a row, aiming no, for a win. No, first time. Yeah. First time he's taken pole at the same venue. Oh, is that, fir- is that first time? Yeah, that's yeah, my yeah. handwriting again, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, it wouldn't have been the 10th time. <laughs> it's <laughs> unbelievable that we hold these and yeah. like, this is your notes. And these are... These are the notes that I have on every driver and every team for each race. Look at that. Oh, my word. So they, they, yes. are, they are the stats that I work off for, uh, for the weekend. It's quite funny, yeah, because with what we, we're in the same world now. Yeah. Us two and you, which is quite cool. Um, but we don't do shit like this, all right? You're, you're clearly, <laughs> you're, you're clearly, you have a skill set. You're a very skilled person. We could not go person. live. If we were live, we'd be, we'd be cancelled. We get imposter syndrome because we don't actually do anything. <laughs> Just talk <laughs> no, to but people. You, no, like. but, no, 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 no. Your skill set is, is is not just talking to people. It's listening to people as well. Mm. So, so far, you've had no notes in front of you whatsoever. And you've just picked up on what I've been saying. It's a conversation. That's what a podcast is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you've got an idea of where you want to go with a podcast. Yeah. But... Interviews are about listening. Yeah, it's it's not about going with a load of bullet points. Now, mm. a commentary is there's no script. I go in there with a fresh mind and and one of the few people who can honestly say I go to work and every day and I have no idea what's going to happen next. And that is brilliant. And yeah, I, and I cool. love that part of my job. Um, but it's my job to react and put <clears throat> things into context. So to do that, I make notes as a little comfort blanket almost so that when something does happen, I can add context to it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's Daniel Ricciardo's last race for McLaren, but it's also his 232nd consecutive start. He hasn't missed one since his first race for HRT at Silverstone in 2011 and it's the longest continuous run of races on the grid it's not the record Lewis Hamilton uh, holds that but of course he missed the Sakir Grand Prix uh, when he got Covid it's those of course it's all those, this information but it's that like... sort of information that puts a bit of context yeah. into what a, a momentous moment it is for Daniel Ricciardo to have his final race for McLaren it's bringing to an end quite a run of races Yeah. do you think one. in your head like I think because when you are announcing big things like the last race championship it's almost so poetic when you do the final bit and you read it out because that's the moment in history yeah they are, they're the moments that's a great that made, they're the moments that made us fall in love with the sport poetry like i think back to last year specifically right at the end the way you commentate that grips the viewer like we're in I your home so. and this is where you live and you may not think about it but millions of people around the world that love formula one you are so key to them because if you take your voice out of that it's a completely different thing like I think about it with football. I think back to some old football commentators from when I first started watching the World Cup, Champions League. As they change it, there's good commentators, bad commentators. But you've stabilised yourself in F1. You do an amazing job at it. Do you have to think before? Are you like days before in your head thinking of like poetic lines or no. things that would rhyme off for like, you are world champion? Or is no. it just coming to you with all the emotion? Well, well no, because if you, if you prepare a line in advance it's going to sound prepared. It's going to sound like you've been thinking about this for a few days. Mm. And quite frankly, 
nothing could have prepared me for Abu Dhabi 2021 yeah, yeah. in advance. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, even in, in in you know the wildest dreams of the most fanciful fancy, fanciful script writer on the planet, no one's going to write a script like that. You know, so you you say what you feel is right in the moment. And you you basically call it how it is. So that last lap in Abu Dhabi, I was aware, obviously, a lot of controversy. But you've got to park that for, yeah. for three and a half miles. Because still, Max needs to get an overtake done if he's going to be champion. Still, Lewis could hold him off. Um, and still, we're going to have something quite dramatic uh, for, the, for the next couple of minutes. So you park all the controversy. But then as the laps unfolded, you, you can bring it, references back into the commentary because you can't ignore it completely. You have to put things into context. But you know in Abu Dhabi, through experience, that once they've gone through turn nine and they're into that final sector, chances are, unless someone makes a mistake, that's the way it's going to stay until the line. The overtaking situations have gone. Um, And then you're thinking about how do you tee this up then for the moment when he crosses the line? Whoever, you know, Max it looks like, or it could be Lewis. And I've still I've no idea what I would have said had Lewis got the championship. We'll wait until hopefully he's got the chance to be an eighth world champion uh, in the future. But you, you time it's like a DJ. Um, it's like a DJ not wanting to crash the vocals. You want to hit your peak, your peak bit just as he gets to the line. And if you can do that, then it's job well done because it all ties in really nicely. You always do. Oh. You always time it fucking perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. That makes me, you you love music. Yeah. yeah. Do you think your love for music might, in some way, have helped you? Or I think it gives you a, a rhythm. To, yeah. Because to, to you speech. do have such a rhythm. Like. Yeah. I, we jokingly commentate and we've done videos where we're playing F1 game we commentate over it and we think we sound slick or whatever. <laughs> we we'll both have like one good line or two good lines. But to continuously do it for a whole race and yeah. like not make like any mistakes. That's pretty well. Or has there been mistakes? There's, That's there's, funny. There's, 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 there's sometimes there's a few. Um, any that stand there, there, They're honest mistakes. <laughs> oh my! My first year at Sky, I got really excited one year uh, in Monaco when I was commentating <laughs> over. I think it was Jensen and Sergio, kind of going wheel to wheel through the chicane. I was getting really animated about it, and Martin's giving me some really strange looks while I'm doing. It. I'm thinking, what's wrong with you, mate? Yeah, come and look at it. It's really exciting. <laughs> and he's just giving me, he's staring at me, giving me a really weird look and starts shaking his head a bit. And I'm like, what, what have I done now? And then he, then he points to the screen and then I look at the screen and it says replay at the top. And I'm doing this live. And, <laughs> and, we, and we're doing it over a replay because I was get, I was so into the race that I actually hadn't seen the replay bit. That's and so I'd forgotten funny. about it because it had happened about five or six laps previous. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's it's broadcasting without a tightrope. Those sort of things are going to happen from time to time. You just got to shrug it off and go, yeah, what a doofus! I'll get on with it. But but yeah, Laura and my other half will tell you. We'll, we'll go on. We'll be driving in the car, and I'll pretend to be a DJ in the car. <laughs> you know, the, the, the track will come on, and I'll and I'll do my yeah. You're listening to Dave Double Dex <laughs> uh, or, or whatever, and I'll do my cheesy DJ bit, and I'll, I'll and, and then when I don't crash the vocals, like yeah, still got it. Because. <laughs> And, and I'm sure that lots of other people try and do that as well. But it's a rhythm and it's a symmetry. And, you know, with with Abu Dhabi, you know, what do you... I'm, I'm, I'm talking and I'm trying to think of how this is going to, going to end as I'm delivering lines. And it suddenly occurred to me, yeah, they've shared a great championship battle. Oh, yeah, sharing. And, and this is all happening in the split second, trust me. Sharing, yeah. Um, oh, that's going Dutch, isn't it? Oh, I could use that. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that's, that will this is what stick I'm with me about. forever. Like, that's so clever, but so mm. and and I just like, yeah, and I just wanted to give it the big one because in that moment I was massively excited. That the adrenaline was running through through Martin and mine's veins. We are we are going to be really lucky if we ever get a lap yeah, like that yeah. to commentate on again. That, yeah, 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 that's going to take some beating in terms of the sheer drama, but also aware. You know, we're not just on Sky, we're on Channel 4 because Sky have allowed um, Channel 4 to show it live too so that as many people as possible can watch that. And, you know, in the end, 44% of the viewing public at that time in the UK were watching that lap. So there was a lot more people watching than normal. So that you think, well, they're not all going to be massive F1 fans. They just want to hear and see the drama. Mm. And then, you know, as he crosses the line, you know, for the first time, Max Verstappen is champion of the world, which I think sounds better than is world champion. And that's why I do it. Only because I think yeah. champion of the world, 
just sounds it does sound better it does sound better it does, you know? yeah. maybe because Danny Champion of the World was one of my favourite books as a kid as well I don't know but <laughs> when you're shouting that in the commentary box though are you thinking about the millions sat at home on their sofa yeah, yeah. do you ever get nervous like yeah, well, yeah, I get nervous. Absolutely, you do, yeah. you do get nervous if before we had, every race. Or? Honestly, if we had a dog in the commentary box, I'd have patted a bald spot. Uh, <laughs> right now. Um, but no, I do because you don't know what's coming. Is that up. why Martin's losing a bit of it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't noticed. There's one member of our team who isn't losing a bit of hair, but I spotted that out of the commentary box window the other day. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I do get nervous, and it's right to get nervous because I'm about to. As I say, broadcast without a tightrope. There's, there's there's no safety net mm. for us, so it's right to, and that that just adds to the adrenaline uh, of the moment. And and if you didn't get nervous, you'd get complacent. And and I don't think there's any room for complacency, not not in the job that we do. It's a good nerve, isn't it? Like, I yeah. think. I, I mean, I do music, so I get nervous before every show that we play. Played a million shows, but you just it's good nerves. And then once you start. Does it just completely go away? Uh, yeah, you kind of forget what you're doing yeah. to a certain extent. I'm I'm then having a conversation with my mate or mates and um, you're broadcasting to one person. There might be millions and there are millions watching around the world, but you're broadcasting to one person or two people. You know, you guys sat on your sofa. Um, you're not broadcasting to, to millions because that's that's not the way we have a conversation with people. That's not the way we address yeah. people, uh, to be honest. And you, look, you mentioned Abu Dhabi. I was talking to Ross Braun earlier this year about something completely different. And then we got onto the subject of Abu Dhabi. And I said, Did you, where were you when you watched that? He said, I was at home. Uh, I was watching it on the TV. I said, well, he said, oh, yeah. And I was standing up shouting at the television. <laughs> I went, you he said, oh, God, yeah. You, were my, you got me so excited. I started shouting at the television. Yeah. And if Ross Braun, a man who's had an awful lot of ups and, and a couple of downs, but not many in Formula One over the years, can start shouting at his TV, then we've done something right on yeah. that, you know? Yeah. He, he, even the, the, the calm, mild-mannered uh, Ross Braun was uh, was getting into it. Ross which is, is a, which is a nice thought. We want to get him on the pod, like, seriously. Well, he's, he's stepped down now, so he's got plenty of time. Yeah. Sorry, Ross, if I'm dropping you in on that one. But, we'll so. grab his number off you after <laughs> we're done. So, I mean, you have... It's not very often... I mean, it happens, but it's not very often that you will have, a, like, a big ending like that. I mean, the majority of your job and what you do, I imagine, is at the start of the race. Yeah. Because you've got 20 cars all going into that first corner. How do you tackle that like i see i see a red car and a silver car coming towards me yeah and i'm like is it is it I Perez? Even, is it you who can't even it? tell who which rebels I mean? which can you really are you yeah. reading the numbers on the car is that how no, you know you can't see the numbers so you just know what position they're in who it's likely going to be you you memorize the grid uh so the last thing i do before martin comes up to the commentary box after the grid walk is memorize the grid just so it's fresh yeah, yeah. and i'll i'll basically i'll go into a bit of a trance like state so like that um where i'll just go right okay verstappen uh, perez leclerc science hamilton well, it's just the other way around so i would have hamilton russell and i'll and i'll visualize the grid in in my mind and i'll go through it and then it's lights out and away we go which which i introduced because it gives you two or three seconds where you're not thinking about what you're saying clever to analyse what has happened. So that's you coined that term. Well, yeah, I assume so. Yeah, well, the Ben Edwards did use it as well, mm -hmm. and you know, I didn't know Ben was using it, and Ben didn't know I was using it because he was broadcasting at the same time as me. He was on the BBC and I was on Sky, and we're both in different commentary boxes. And it was only after about three races. I don't know who Ben. Ed, ben Ed uh, so, so Ben, Ben, <laughs> uh, been commentating on F1 longer than I have. Well. Uh, to be honest, he and John Watson did the, did the digital stuff in the year. Ben, Ben's done a whole host of stuff over the years. He's a, a brilliant commentator and, and a thoroughly brilliant guy as well. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to get to know Ben over the years. So, But what I didn't know and what he didn't know is that we were both using it. Um, yeah, on a little 50th birthday video that uh, that some of the guys put together for me. I've got Ben say, you can have the phrase now, it's yours. Um, <laughs> so Ben, if you're listening, it's mine. Um, uh, I, think, I think I've made, I've, I've made a bit more of it and, and people associate me with that phrase. Yeah, they do. Um, but I say it because I just want to buy myself a bit of time to see what's happened. And then after that, you just picking things out mm. and and sometimes hoping you've got it right because you don't always see everything you need to the biggest clue is that is the the camera above the the engine uh, air, air box which is yet yellow or black 
depending on on which driver who's the team is leader. Which. But well, don't some of them swip, swap? Well, it, yeah, but it used to be team leader. Now it's just yeah. There's not really some teams. It's not really a thing anymore, is no. it? The team? So this well, is so the biggest problem this season has been that after years of having the black camera. Lewis has switched to yellow mm. and that really has taken a bit of getting used to mm. and it's gone with his crash helmet and, 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 the, and the numbering on the car but it's like Lewis please please swap it back again because you know I don't just I, I don't like change I got used to the black camera on that one you know yeah, the yeah. yellow confused me for a while and it, in Hungary it did it, um, for a couple of corners actually and that was once again going back to broadcasting Hungary without this year. a tightrope yeah, I think I remember you saying it, and I'm sitting there thinking, he's got that fucking wrong. That's not yeah. Lewis. That's yeah, exactly. George. And and but it's it's just years of of knowing Lewis was the black tea camera. When when it cuts to something like that that is a bit out of sync with the rest of the lap, you, you kind of instantly go in. I mean, I should have taken a pause and then gone yeah, in. Yeah. I kind of kicked myself a little bit afterwards that I didn't do that. Mm. But I'm like, see, I'm like football or, you know, darts, you know, or horse racing or, or most other sports. Because there are so many different things happening on the lap at the same time, you, there's a, there's a lot of cuts that are out of sync with the narrative that you might be saying at the time. A lot of things happen that you're not expecting to happen and you've got to have instant kind of identification and recall as to as to what that is it's not like a football match where it's just you know on a pitch back yeah, and forth yeah, yeah. there's there's things happening on the far side of the, the track that you can't see necessarily or haven't been featured for a while and that's where you know the trying to cover everything becomes really really tricky and i i do like the way that they brought picture in picture in now to, to the coverage and i've been saying you know to to, to the guys at uh, formula one for years Start doing a bit of that. What's that? So um, you'll see sometimes we'll be on, we'll be covering one thing on the main screen, and then you've got the the timing tower on the left hand side yeah, yeah. of the screen, and there'll be a box, and that will have some action in that box. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. Yeah. And, and I think it's really, really important to bring that in because sometimes there are two stories going on at the same time. Yeah, for sure. Well, we said that we we wanted to see more of the commentary. Where the box comes up and you can see more in the box. So Abu Dhabi last year, we actually did put a camera in a commentary box. Mm. And some for some strange reason, and honestly, I didn't touch it, and Martin swears he didn't touch it, um, the camera that was kind of facing the both of us about 10 minutes before the start did that. No. And we've got a great bit of footage of Martin's feet <laughs> <laughs> during the last lap. That would have been amazing video as well. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, it, it, we we were pretty animated. The thing that, that surprised me was that you guys stand up when you do the commentary. Well, why, yeah, but I why pictured not? you sitting down. No, yeah, it's so much better. So exactly. much better. By standing up, it frees the diaphragm, doesn't mm. it? And um, it also just means we can we can get more excited. We don't get lethargic. You know, yeah. we we don't fall asleep like you guys on a on a sofa on a Sunday <laughs> yeah. afternoon. Go on, you've all done it. <laughs> oh, what about straight after a race? You like run to the toilet? Because if it's been a delayed, <laughs> if it's been a delayed race, right, you must be desperate for a piss. There I mean, I would have be. been times, uh, and I do make sure that I go for a wee about twenty minutes before <laughs> they come to us. Um, sometimes a bit longer because you know, the toilet facilities are not great at all tracks. The 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 porter cabins in Canada are particularly well that we used to have were particularly awful. The porter cabins in Imola that we still have are not particularly. We had nice. holes in the floor, mm -hmm. Imola. We did, which yeah, was lovely. Nice. We, we were in Imola. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, we we had porter loos that had been there all weekend. That that wasn't that wasn't very nice, to be fair. Uh, the Canadian ones used to be worse because it used to be hotter and yeah, you know, the sun used to bake down. Uh, the five star glory of Formula yeah. One. Eh? In fact, we got taken off go. air once because of the uh, the porter loos in Canada. Um, just as Martin and I were talking, uh, about to talk in commentary, someone dropped off a, uh, a porta loo, but they dropped it right on top of the fiber optic cables going back no. to the TV oh, compound shit. and managed to cut. We have like an A and a B twice as a backup, but managed to cut one A and one B from different lines. And so we went completely off air. Oh shit. We were so crap. We got taken off air. <laughs> Funny, funny how those little mistakes happen. No one at home would even know that it was because <laughs> of a fucking porta loo. <laughs> yeah, but it, 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 these these things do happen, you know. Mm. We've done enough races now to to have pretty seen uh, seen pretty much everything. But yeah, uh, we might bring Comcam in uh, for a bit. Um, there are times that I do race off to the loop, not often. It, bladder control very important uh, for a commentator. I've done I've left once, 
uh, at Silverstone when we had an hour's uh, red flag. Um, I, I did go off to the loo there and left Martin talking, but the loos were next door, so that was okay. Mm-hmm. Belgium last year, we we were talking for a long time, obviously, because nothing was happening. Martin went to get a cup of tea and some biscuits and went to get a cup of tea. <laughs> Imagine you guys' commentary box, muting the mic, quick yeah. fucking cookie, <laughs> whack a hot chocolate, cup of tea. mic comes back on. Exactly. <laughs> and then he realised it was this was going to take a while. Um, and we were going to be around for a while. And Martin was riding his bike back home. So he actually got changed whilst commentating because uh, nothing was happening. So we were just talking away. And he got changed from his shirt and uh, trousers to his full wet weather motorcycle gear. <laughs> That's such a weird <laughs> thought. Yeah. Um, and at one stage, at one stage, he was stood there in his boxer shorts. I'm like, what is going on here? Is, you know? So if you had a com cam then, that yeah, would have been hilarious. that would have been bad. You wouldn't have wanted that. <laughs> talking about Martin and, talk, and you talking about Jensen and other people, You've been in sport 17 years now. Are you friends? Like, you must be so tight with certain people in the paddock. Like, are you actually, would you consider yourself friends with the drivers or like the teams or? Yeah, look, I I, I, I have a relationship with all the drivers and, and, and the teams. Um, and I know a lot of people uh, within the teams. I think it's very, if you're going to have a friendship with a driver, it's got to be a really good friendship because there are times you're going to say things that aren't, full you know full praiseworthy of, of their efforts and you have to be honest mm. um so i wouldn't i would say yes I'm, I'm i'm friends with the drivers and and certainly have been out you know for for social time as it were but you do my, my first my, my first responsibility is to is to the viewers of Sky Sports and those that take our commentary around the world and to the sport itself. Um, and I try and be as honest as I possibly can. Sometimes you you can't break a confidence. You'll know something, but you just can't. You can't break a confidence uh, in that respect. So friendships are really difficult mm-hmm. yeah. to have in that manner. But there, I, I have a lot of friends within Formula One and within the teams. And I've never had... I've never had a, a driver who has been upset or annoyed with me or was not prepared to stand and have a conversation with us. So yeah. mm-hmm. so I, I, I try and, and see the positives and the pluses in, in all situations. Um, I remember, I remember, first because it was the first time I'd ever been on a private jet. Um, oh, I've never done a private yeah, jet. Yeah, we're still waiting for that. Oh, What's it, it like? It was lovely. To be honest. It was a small private jet, um, but we were in Austin. And I was going off to to do something with uh, uh, with Max, and uh, and for for a, uh, one of the Red Bull partners, um, you know, sponsors. And we were sat on a plane, and um, so as we're sat now, but a lot closer to each other. And there was Max, and there was his manager uh, Raymond, and there's myself, and a couple of guys from the sponsors. And there was only about six seats on the plane, and it was the day after the U.S. race. And um, Max, you, you remember the one when Max had overtaken Kimmy, but on the inside, and he got kicked off the podium just before he went onto the podium. So it was uh, a few years ago, right? Yeah, okay, that, you don't, yeah. right. <laughs> don't so, remember that one. So it, I, it was a bit, it was a bit controversial. We kind of sat there and you know making polite conversation. And I just, Max, should we get the elephant out of the room right now? <laughs> he went, yeah. What's that? I went, they did the right thing, mate. He went. <laughs> No, they didn't. I went, yes, they did. Uh-oh. <laughs> I said, you were so far off the track. They couldn't have left you on there. Well, I, did, I said, Max, honestly, mate, <laughs> they, they really had to do that. They should have done it a bit earlier. You shouldn't have gone up to the cool down room. But I think the stewards were right. They really were. And after a couple of minutes, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I do. I'm just a bit sore about it. I didn't, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I really wanted that podium. And he's gone back and he's won races there, so that's fine. Um, but we had a really good chat about it. And, you know, my relationship with Max since, and that was the first time I'd really kind of sat down in a social environment with him, seen him talk to him at many a press conference. Mm. But our relationship since has been, you know, has been very good. Same, same with Lewis. I've known Lewis now for you know, a long, long time. And, and I hope both of them will always feel that I'll be as honest as I can about a situation. Yeah. So let's go back to Abu Dhabi again, because I don't tweet about this because 140 characters just doesn't cover it. But I get accused by Max fans of favouring Lewis and I get accused by Lewis fans of favouring Max. And what I would say about Abu Dhabi is that it wasn't right. 
mistakes happened, as were pointed out in the FIA uh, in the FIA report into it. But the referee does make mistakes. You know, I'm, I've been to many a West Ham match and yeah. have left feeling a little bit robbed you by see him football all the time. They've got VAR and they still can't get it right. Correct. You've been to West Ham too. Right. <laughs> um, you know. Um, you're an Arsenal fan. I still, I still don't think our guy should have uh, been sent off at your place last year. Uh, Soufal should have been sent off because that was a perfectly well timed tackle. Shouldn't have been a penalty. Fabianski saved it really well, but he shouldn't have been sent off. Got yeah, I mean, I that, completely like, disagree. But... Yeah, of course you do. But that's, <laughs> but, that, and that's, but that's sport, and that's how it should be. Yeah, exactly. But what's going to change the result? Nothing. Yeah. The result's not going to change, and and the, the referee is entitled to make a mistake because they're human. We don't like it as sporting fans. But I don't think it was manipulated in the way that the FIA, I certainly don't think, there's decided Max had to win the championship. You know, Jean Todd wasn't on the phone to Michael Massey going, right, you must give this to Max. I don't think Red Bull pressured Michael Massey into a situation. The team radio might make it sound that way, but Michael Massey isn't sat there, you know, thinking, oh, I must do what Red Bull say. Well, wasn't last year the first year they actually allowed the teams to talk to? Yeah, and, they sh- and, and they've now stopped that, which they yeah. should. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You, you, but it, you can't you can't blame Red Bull for trying to take advantage of, of it. If you're allowed to do it, then you of course you can't. But they sh- they shouldn't be able to do that. Um, mm. It's it's I don't think it's right that you know a football manager is allowed to shout at a referee from the touchlines. Mm. You know, even though sometimes David Moyes has to do it because we have been robbed again. Um, <laughs> but my, my my theory is always mistakes happen. We don't like it, but we have to accept it. And and what I find really difficult with Abu Dhabi at the moment is is a reluctance from people to accept that what's happened has happened and now it's time to move on. You know, and and there's a lot of toxicity out there on social media. Mm -hmm. It's just got to stop because it doesn't do anybody any good because what's going to change? Nothing, you know? And and I get accused of, oh, you haven't said anything on Twitter about it. Why? Yeah. You know, I'll make a point and I'll make a point on air as as I have done. Martin will do the same. Ted will do the same. You know, we, we're all entitled to our opinions and our opinions are such that, you know, yes, it was a mistake. It was a horrible mistake. And, and one of the <laughs> things I, I wanted to talk to Max about in the interview I did in, um, in, in Abu Dhabi with him is, did you feel for Lewis at the time? You know, because because that was a hard one to take. And I yeah. thought Max was, was very generous in what he said uh, about Lewis that night. But it's... For the sake of us all, we've got to move on a little bit now, and and you know I'll show you on my Twitter feed the the tweets I've had in the last forty eight hours about it. You know, <laughs> it's just not right. It's something we're still learning as well because we've had like drivers on and we've been given these amazing opportunities. But same as you, like we we commentate and have our own show. We speak about it. They come on our show. They talk about it. We learn about them, and we then we 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 love these guys. Like they're part of yeah. the family. Then we we become friends with them. But then if they go and have a shit race or something happens, oh, we'll we have d- to we'll talk about, about it on the pod. So it's really difficult divide of mm. like holding a friendship. Like you say, it has to be so tight that they can laugh at the you've fact got, you've that. You've got to be respectful. And, 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 and the one thing I would say about every single driver that has graced the sport is that they have an ability that we don't have. You know, Formula One drivers just have this amazing ability to process a huge amount of information um, and and to be have an awareness that that a normal driver just doesn't have, and compute all this at two hundred miles an hour, and race wheel to wheel, and pull off some of the most incredible overtakes, mm. and give us some of the most incredible excitement week after week after week. I couldn't do what these guys do, mm. you know. So having had three laps in an F one car. You know, I, I now realise... Is, is that how many times you've been out in a car? Three, three laps. In an F1 car. You drove it? I drove it. How was it? It was amazing. Basically. What was it? Was it? <laughs> it was the Lotus that Kimi Raikkonen won in Australia oh, wow. Wow. Uh, at that time. It was it was the most amazing five minutes of my life, quite wow. frankly. But a newfound respect was, was delivered right there and then yeah. for everyone who gets in there and races. Mm. I was just struggling to keep the thing on the track and I was the only one on it. How was you your know? neck after that? My neck was okay which I was then told was because I wasn't going fast enough. But <laughs> I did 175 miles an hour Blimey. down That's not the straight. That's that not was bad. okay. I, it, I then thought, this is why I should never be an F1 driver. If I turned right down the straight, that would cause a right old mess. <laughs> you know how... You know, That's what, what I'd be thinking You know well, when you're a kid, you sit like, don't press that red button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I could just what end I, it all right what now. What if I press that red button? Yeah. <laughs> 
wouldn't have worked. I like to go on Twitter because sometimes sometimes I'll get a stat idea from Twitter. I'll have some great interaction with people. I had the best bit of feedback um, ever uh, to any of my commentaries that I got off Twitter. Second race uh, that I'd done for Sky when uh, someone tweeted me, uh, Crofty, why don't you use the practice sessions to practice being a little less shit? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. No, I thought that was great feedback. It was a brilliantly constructed <laughs> sentence. What did you say back? It, it, it was a heartfelt point. You know, he put he put across his point ever so well. I just liked it. I thought that's brilliant. I'll use that. I'll take that on board. I'll use it forever. I think what I'm Jeez. trying what I'm trying to say is, you know, I've got a very thick skin and and you can say that, but I'd rather you, rather people didn't. Although yeah. in this instance, mm. I thought it was quite funny. Yeah. Um better than some of the comments I've had over the years. Um but just there's a toxicity and and it's i think if people are having a bad time in their own life they'll lash out to others Mm. so i often think it's not me they're trying to lash out at it's just life in general and and it's i just happen to be the person that they that they want to shout at. it's definitely not you because if they removed you from the sport then it wouldn't be the same and then they'd want you back so thank you for that (laughs) it's 100 percent true we spoke about a little bit earlier but like i said that moment of you last year this is why we've started the pod i mean our whole show everything we've achieved this year has been uh, it's been the best year of my life so i need to cut them crofty we we owe you everything everything. take the laptop take my phone (laughs) i you said earlier there's a bit of memorabilia in here, but I'm yeah. looking around and I still can't yeah, see. Yeah, because you asked me be. for some memorabilia, right? And and I'm not a, I'm not a collector of memorabilia at all. I collect memories, um, but there is a bit of memorabilia in here. Yeah, and, I'm trying to figure I'm out. Like looking around, did the candlestick? Well. Hang on, that there's a centre book. There is. Well, that's not memorabilia. That's just that's just. A book. But oh, he's getting up again. Last time he's come back with the notes. We're going right, to be now. Where's he off to? Where's he let's, off to? Let's do the memorabilia. Oh, we're having a little look now around oh, the lounge. Oh, I've spotted it. Oh, what yes. are they? What is that? Wow. What are they? That's a gear. I thought it was a thing for a a coffee. It is. So that, it it looks just looks really nice on the shelf. Um, That is from the 2009 Braun Championship winning car. That's the second and third gear. So Jensen Button's car. Yeah. Let's go. That's special. Wow. So these actually won a championship. They did. Wow. And Braun are only around for one year, right? So this is like the, o- this, this is the, these are the only two gears in existence. And what was wonderful, um, so uh, Andrew Shovlin and his family uh, came round um, to the house. Um, and Andrew was Jensen's race engineer uh, that year. And so he saw these and he went, is that what I think it is? I said, I don't know, mate. What do you think it is? He went, that's the second and third gear off the Braun, isn't it? I went, how the hell do you know that? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I said, how would you Honestly, know that? I said, I, I am, you know, I am as impressed as I uh, as I am absolutely disgusted at your complete anorak nature here, Sean. ridiculous. How do you know it, it's first yeah, surely, and second? Or, or a fat car. He surely said, they he said yeah, well, we did something a bit different that year with them. I went, really? He went, yeah, yeah, they, they, they stand out a mile. I said, well, they didn't stand out a mile to that's me. So I just thought they looked like a really good ornament. <laughs> so that is from, that's from the brawn. That's wow. my... Uh, I'm going to hand these back. I don't feel, yeah, I don't feel comfortable holding ornaments. this kind of thing. They're brilliantly machined as well. They are absolutely superb. But we were. They just look really good on the shelf. They know? do look. They fit in with everything else that you've got chrome sort of going on. <laughs> but we, we were lucky enough to like get a little tour around Red Bull's garage uh, in Zanvor. Uh-huh. And we actually got to see like the engines and stuff. And wow, like what a piece of craftsmanship. Like, oh, just... How do these guys know what the fuck they're doing? <laughs> it's mental because they are they are very very clever people yeah, yeah you got and the they have the studied long garage. and hard and uh, yeah form- see Formula 1 attracts the best of the best and as l- as long as you are good enough and prepared to prepare to put the effort in so that you continue being the best of the yeah. best and you inspire other people to be best of the best you will always find a natural home uh, in Formula 1 and, and, and I like that about the sport uh, the relentless nature of it keeps you young uh, as well because I still think that I've been in the sport for about three years because everything's just gone by in a blur. Yeah. It's the first thing I said to Simon Lazenby uh, when, when Sky got the rights. I said, mate, you know, I'll strap yourself in and hold on because this is quite a ride and things will just go by in a blur. Mm. This last year, yeah. mate, we can't <laughs> believe how quickly this year has gone. Like It's end of season already and we felt yeah. like it started yesterday. It's, oh, I'm still back in nuts. Bahrain at winter testing. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah. So wh- when does your kind of year start kicking off again? When do you start getting back into the we have Christmas, New Year? Like when are you back in F1 mode? Or do you never really switch off? I don't really switch off. Never. Uh, to be fair. Enjoy the World Cup for a bit now. I, I, I would enjoy the World Cup. Um, I'm, I'm addressing the Oxford Union on Tuesday, which is quite an honour, I must yep. admit. So I've got to sit and write a speech. Uh, which is a bit weird because I don't write speeches out. Yeah, I was going to say, how comfortable are you doing anything away from commentary? Well, well, I'm comfortable doing the speech. It's just the writing part. You know, I, I, everything I do is it's normally off the it's top, like improvisation yeah. off the top yeah, of my yeah, head. Yeah. So now I've got to write out something for 15 minutes and uh, go and do that. So uh, what have Bill Clinton, the Dalai Lama and me got in common? We've all addressed the Oxford Union. It's a bit of a weird one. That, <laughs> it's not but bad people to I, compare against. I might, doubt, I might dine out on that one for a few years, to be fair. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it tails off a bit, obviously, in December. Uh, but you, you're straight back on it again uh, in January, launch season, uh, at the start of February, testing the week before mm. uh, the, the season starts. There, there'll be lots of preparation. But it's important to rest as well. You know, you, you need you need to try and rest up a bit because of the relentless nature. I'd, this is the first, the first time I've spent more than three days at home since... Trying to think. Since before I went to Austin, wow. to be honest, because obviously we were in Vegas yeah, together yeah, yeah. On, on the week off in between mm-hmm. uh, Mexico and Brazil. Which was a great weekend, by the way. You it wasn't bad, to, was it? You think it's going to be a good race next year? <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. I hope it's going to be a good race. I think it's going to be an amazing experience. I think it's going to look sensational. I hope mm. the track gives us a lot of overtaking opportunities. There were a few crashes going on, actually, weren't they? A couple of them went into the wall. Lewis, yeah, Lewis said that he stopped when he was doing the donuts because he actually put so much smoke up in the air he couldn't see where he was going. <laughs> Which, and then, so you know, remember in Brazil when George went off in qualifying? And then he spun the car around to try and get back out on the yeah, track again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually admitted that because he'd been to Vegas and he was doing donuts the week before, it helped him out. That gave him the idea to try and spin it round, do a donut. Sadly, uh, he ended up in the gravel, um, and it didn't quite work well, out as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Did, didn't he? yeah but Ve- Vegas kind of helped him out a little bit on that uh, inspiration. To be mm. fair, but yeah, um, we'll, we'll we'll try and have a nice family time of it now because it's important to spend a bit of time with the family because they don't see a huge amount of me. Yeah. during the course of the year well mate appreciate you taking the time you mean you literally got Absol- back from Abu Dhabi yesterday and we're already <laughs> absolute pleasure you got the yeah, pit stop, um, yeah you got about another five minutes so I've got to go and get my hair cut <laughs> <laughs> no, I go, well I go to the same I've, I go to the same hair hairstylist barbers uh, that I've been going to now for god 22 years and um, they know who you are what you do yeah, but they, they they know me as the bloke who comes in to get his hair cut and hasn't changed it in the well, last 22 years. <laughs> well, two and a half on the side, to be fair. A bit messy on top. Give it a trim. Very Honestly, nice. the reason I go back there is because, is because I don't have to say what I want done. Susie knows what <laughs> yeah. I want done. Just sit down and start gossiping. You must have stylists on the road, though. If you're doing like a triple oh, header. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make, no, makeup. makeup, everything. Yeah. Vocation, not vacation. <laughs> <laughs> mate oh. it's been an order to sit down with you well, it's like we lovely. said yeah, before thank mate thank you so much big inspiration with what we do so it's nice to be in your home chatting thank and you. uh i think we're going to spend probably a lot of time together next year if you don't mind i don't mind that at all can we talk metal next year because we haven't talked metal at all we haven't we? talked metal you are you're a massive metal head yeah um so am i who are you into i like slipknot do you like Slipknot? New album's amazing. It is, yeah. He, like, he on YouTube all the time. All he's doing is searching for videos of Slipknot, new ones, because you can't see. Yeah, I love it. You don't know much about them. Is well, right? I'm just always trying to find new information. Like as a kid, I just loved googling my favorite bands. But I like Deftones, like Foo Fighters, like who doesn't? Yeah, anyone? You seen Slipknot live? Yeah, I have like four times. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> have you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they're touring next year. Let's fucking let's we go. Yeah, Should yeah, we go together? Let's guys. go. Well, they're doing actually. They're doing download, aren't they? Have you been to download? <laughs> Have I been to download? Have you really? Right, okay. Without trying to sound like an old man here, um, I was at download. Every year for 30 years. I was at download before they started calling it download. Yeah, <laughs> I was at Monsters of Rock. Um, but we took, da- we took Danny Rick uh, to download. Oh, no way. This is one of my favourite features we ever did at Sky. Um, <laughs> where I said to Danny, I said, um, Parkway Drive are playing download this year. He went, yeah, mate, I know. I said, it's a weekend off. He went, yeah. I said, if I can get the passes... Should we do some filming? I'm like, go and see Parkway Drive together. They're an Australian band, isn't they? Yeah, but he's a big fan of theirs. I said, Gaslight Anthem are playing the same day as well. He went, oh, if you, if you could. Do Who? It. Gaslight Anthem? Yeah, yeah. Love them. Man, you, yeah. You've never even heard of them. <laughs> no, I've got a clue who they are. 50, 59 Sound, handwritten, two classic tracks. Anyway, um, so I phoned up 
the press people at Down, I went, can I have nine passes, please, to go and do some <laughs> filming? And why is that? So I explained the idea. Yeah, 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 we can sort that out, no problem. So we all, we all went up to, uh, to Donington. And um, on the way up, I said to, to, to Daniel, um, so how do you like living in Woburn Sands anyway? Well, it's all right. I said, well, it's not exactly you know, driver territory, but I can understand it because obviously, you know, you're in the Red Bull Sim quite a bit. Mm. Um, he said, yeah, but I'm, I'm moving to Monaco soon, so I'm not going to be there for long. I went, I'm moving to Monaco. I went, yeah, I said, there's only two reasons people move to Monaco, uh, Daniel. I said, they like the sunshine and they're about to get a massive pay rise. <laughs> he went, well, it might be the latter. I went, are you, go- are you moving to Red Bull? He went, well, I can't say. I said, well, I think Mark Webber's retiring. <laughs> He said, why is that? I said, because he took us all out for uh, for dinner in uh, Australia and he's never taken the media out for dinner before. So it's obviously his <laughs> yeah, last year. Yeah. And um, I said, so you'll be the next in line. He went, well, yeah, I could, could be. I said, right, okay. Do you trust me? He went, yes. I said, if I ask you a couple of questions on film about it and promise not to show this until you get the job announced uh, properly... Can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah, yeah, no worries. So I asked him a couple of questions That's along great. the lines of, if Mark retires, you know, are you ready for it? And he's like, yeah, 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 I'm ready. But I forget what his answers were. And um, lo and behold, he gets the Red Bull seat. And we had this big feature with Daniel Ricciardo at Download. Oh, um, it was that Download you'd ask the question? Uh, yeah, so. that we could, uh, we could put out. So, you know, Daniel, thank you. Did us a really good favour on that one. And, you know, we kind of had the exclusive. So, <laughs> so either way... We walked around Download all day. So he was a Toro Rosso driver then. We got recognised by two people, which I think would change a bit now. I think he'd get recognised by a you few more. funny oh, glasses. And then when Partway Drive came on, we did a brilliant bit with Partway Drive. In fact, we got um, we got the band to uh, to give us a lights out and away we go. Like a, like a you know, proper metalcore version. Yeah. Uh, so Winston did as a lights out. <laughs> and, and it was mega someone lost the footage I've no idea no. where that went so we lost that we'll have to do one at your show yeah I'm, I'm playing Silverstone next year are you? well I'm putting it out into the ether we're yeah. trying we're going to make it happen I'll have a chat with him what do you play? Uh, drums I knew he was a drummer yeah if we hit it from all angles <laughs> we, we're just manifesting we at the moment do that. We'll, I feel like if we'll Crofty you. asked someone oh, something, yeah. they're probably yeah. going to say yes I'll have, I'll have a word with the powers that be so, <laughs> so we lost that footage and we also lost the bit where Parkway Drive came on and Daniel said, I want to go in the mosh pit. I went, well, come on then. Here's a GoPro. Let's do it. No, really. So we, we had GoPro footage of a Formula One driver in the middle of the season, <laughs> in the middle of a mosh pit. I bet his team was down like losing well, it. No one even realised it was him. Well, the team never knew. Oh. So the team never knew he did it. <laughs> oh, and you've we, lost we never told him. We've now lost the footage, oh, which is no. absolutely appalling. But we looked after him. We made sure he was okay. But we, it was a mega feature. So yeah, we did we did download. But let's go back and do uh, Slipknot a download. Yeah, I'd and love two to. two nights of Metallica, a Thursday and a and, and a Saturday. All right, with completely but, different set lists. But the deal is, we have to bring someone else from F one, like Martin Brundle. Yeah. Okay, I've, or I've, Ted, or someone okay, so who I've, shouldn't be there. I've taken Martin to West Ham. I've taken him to the darts. I have a picture of Martin with a foam finger. Uh, you know, yeah. one of those giant <laughs> foam, <laughs> yeah. foam hands. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Do, 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 do. It's um, <laughs> buy a scrapbook. The photos in the scrapbook. Um, who could I bring? Paul DeResta would never do it because he hates heavy metal. I took Johnny and Ant to see. It's got to be someone who who would fucking hate it. So I, I took Johnny and Ant to Sierra Smith in Austin once under protest with them both going oh I've no idea what they, they, they sing and after two songs Johnny's like oh these guys are great I know what they do and yes Johnny I did say <laughs> to be fair um, but yeah I, let's uh, let's see what we can do alright because there the are date? some great bands yeah Download's Download fucking awesome as long as it doesn't rain I went oh, in 2009 no, if, it, if it rains that makes it no mate I went in 2009 and they called it Drownload because there was literally <laughs> about this much water my whole tent was Drown soaked load. like yeah. it was brutal yeah don't do that we'll do some glamping alright we'll it. get a caravan deal from, from the beautiful like F1 paddock pass like club beautiful food to some fucking shit field <laughs> in the middle of nowhere <laughs> pissing with rain with music blasting in your ears damn right that's I'm a all perfect way to spend a weekend <laughs> off Perfect. <laughs> Unreal. Cheers. Crofty, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure. This has been a le- one of my favourite podcasts we've ever done. It's, yeah, it's been unreal. Yeah, we're now going to go and put the latest Slipknot album on. You, you better go. <laughs> yeah, I'll go way outside of the car. Cheers for having me, guys. And the new Megadeth album is even better. <laughs> Joel, I haven't actually really listened to Megadeth that much. Yeah, what? But I, I will. I, I, I know a few songs, yeah. but 
Oh, all right. When Big sells, it, but who's buying? It's classic. When did it come out? When did the album come oh, out? I got it about four weeks ago. See ya. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, thanks for coming on, Crofty. Pleasure. Take care. And you. <laughs>